Biomimicry uh, essentially is a term um, that was the outcome of um, some work that was being done in the beginning of the 20th century. Biologists and physicists were started, started to collaborate and apply physical principles in order to explain the phenomena in biology. Um, and, and, and that particular discipline was called biophysics. At the time, there was a, a young, very talented biophysicist called Otto Schmidt, who um, around about the 1950s um, was working on his doctoral thesis, looking at a particular application um, that he, he that was inspired by his research in biophysics. And he didn't have a name or there wasn't a term that he could use to describe what he was trying to do, which is essentially apply the knowledge that he'd, he was um, developing and gathering through biophysics into um, the technological world, into engineering. And so he coined the term bi biomimetics in order to describe that very thing, the application of knowledge and understanding from biophysics. But of course it didn't start there. It's a, it's a wider concept that began thousands of years ago and I'll, I'll let Richard um, talk more about that. You're gonna yeah. take us back a thousand years, Richard. Yeah, whoa. In the there beginning. <clears throat> In the beginning. No, I mean, to me, biomimicry is about looking at how nature solves problems and then translating that into man-made technologies, whether it's um, you know pure innovation or whether it's you know, sustainable or environmental. Um, it's um, as simple as that, but it's also as complex. As so we've had, it sounds like there's a bit of biology and physics. There's a bit of kind of looking at nature, observation, design. It's a very multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary concept. Is that a fair comment to make? And is that essential as well? Oh, yeah, I mean, because you have to consider, so example being the Royal Society, they should have been looking into the circular economy and biomimicry as well. And with that, they brought chemists and material science and some product designers together. And the great thing about that is they need the industrial and product designers to speak to the chemists to come up with new biomaterials that are better than the ones we've got. And it's getting out of the silo of design and business that's very much was a peculiar problem of the 20th century, even going back to the Industrial Revolution, where we're actually just saying, right, you're good at one thing, let's focus on that. When you actually you look at back to the great innovators, you know, going back a few hundred years, they were influenced by multiple areas and also worked in different fields as well. And so that's some of the some of the science, like what is it, maybe one of the best ways for us to start talking about what it is or help the audience get to a place where they maybe can see it a bit more is to talk about what it actually looks like or what it, what's what it looks like to start thinking in this way and also what it looks like when you make stuff. From um, so around about the 1950s, a um, uh, a mountaineer called Georges de Mistral, um, who loved to walk his dog every day in, in the mountains, would come down and, and spend lots and lots of time taking these th these burrs, pulling them off his dog's fur and off his um, off his off his clothes. And he was curious to work out, you know, how could these little um, structures be so difficult to to remove from fluffy surfaces. So he just, a simple observation under the microscope revealed these tiny little hooks um, that form at the tip of every spike. Um, and those tiny hooks are what clamp onto uh, or hook onto uh, the fluffy surface, make it very, very difficult to pull off. So if I try and pull this off a towel, uh, a toweling fabric which mimics um, the uh, fur of an animal, it's incredibly, incredibly difficult to, to disconnect it. And actually when you do, you get these little bits that come off that have seeds on them. And essentially that's what the burr wants to do. It's, it's, a, it's a pest. It doesn't produce any fruit or anything that an animal would want to eat. Um, but it still needs to disperse its seeds. It doesn't flower, um, it doesn't grow high up, so it doesn't get washed, uh, blown away by the wind. So the, 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 the mechanism it's developed um, or evolved in order to get its seeds around is by um, becoming an annoying pest that just leches onto your clothes. And Having, how do you go from that to so, Velcro? <laughs> so, um, Having studied, uh, having identified these little hooks um, on the on the tips of the the burr, 
and um, the, the fluffy surface, he thought this would be a fantastic um, technology to uh, uh, to bring into the man-made sector um, and create uh, uh, structures that can or systems that can stick to each other without using glue and are reversible. So um, he collaborated with a French fabric mill that specialized in making um, these, these sorts of cloth structures. So what you have here is um, the cloth being woven in the XY direction and um, uh, additional loops or piles as they're called being introduced into the Z direction. Um, and, and he felt that that was a fantastic starting point. So originally they made some trials uh, creating fabrics using this particular uh, structure with cotton and what they could do was they created obviously a surface that was just like the, um, the towel but they could control the amount of loops that you'd get per square inch or square centimetre and they could also disrupt those loops so break them um, and this is how they engineered the two surfaces. So the surface with the broken loop mimics the uh, needle uh, tip of the, or the, the, the tip of the, um, the burr. And uh, the, the fluffy surface um, imitates or replicate, replicates the, uh, the, the furry sort of um, animal, animal skin. So the sticky bit of the Velcro has the similar start, like the sort of, hook bits on it. That's I mean, it. no, I've never like observed that about Velcro before because you never really look that closely at it, I suppose. Sure. I mean, yeah. um, Richard, when we were just walking to the studio, you grabbed that Satsuma and you said, I, can I borrow this? Why did you do that? Well, because if You're you think... hungry. Well, I was, yeah, I'm hungry as well. You know, you fed me yet. But um, one of the things is, although I couldn't find it, is a, a pomelo, which is a large orange. And... Basically, if you think about it, these fall off the trees and then they don't bruise the fruit inside. And if nobody minds, be peeling it into it. Unfortunately, you can't see it because it's not quite the same as a pomelo, but the structure of basically the, the flesh inside, what it does is it's a, this type of material called an exotic material and actually um, distributes the energy round the skin instead of actually into the fruit. And you've get, you're getting smart textiles developed in this way. Um, BMW are now actually developing helmets for use in their factories that are a light, lot more lightweight, but then protect their workers a lot better. And someone like BMW, have they, have they been inspired by nature? Or yeah. Is, yeah, so they, yeah, so they directly worked with their research teams based in Stuttgart and Freiburg. And I know that one of the things you talk about a bit, Richard, or interested in is the kind of observation of systems and actually taking this above like a single product lens, but actually how do processes and how can you design a system and process also inspired by nature. Yeah, I mean, let's skip through to, we'll go past the penguins. I mean, ants, um, I love studying the ants in, in my garden, or occasionally come into my house, where my wife wouldn't let me talking about that in public, but there's a complex system. These animals are, you know, very small brain, but they know, they communicate through pheromones, trails. They, you know, there's a chaos in the order. There's built-in redundancy through the swarm as well. So they work as a, you know, complete hive, mind effectively and they problem solve. They know where the food is. Once one of them <coughs> finds the food, they, um, they go find uh, to find it. They build nests, they're all working together. And it's this kind of study, you start seeing you know, changes in complexity, self-organization, and kind of this emergent properties that you kind of, unexpectedness that you don't normally get by just looking at kind of a, a simple processes. So yeah, you could be walking around in your garden perhaps or in your kitchen, see a load of ants walking around and just think, oh, there's, there are ants are walking around. They're, they've got quite a simple goal they're not doing anything crazily complex. They're, you know, they're building a nest, they're getting food. But actually, if you watch the patterns of the way they're moving there and you studied it, you'd see... And what, I mean, I guess one of the things is what can we learn from examples like this? Computers, or, sorry to interrupt. There's no, computer scientists out there studying the complexity of ants and other um, basically swarm uh, insects. And one of my advisory board members, brilliant... Um, guy called Dr. Rupert Soar and the teams he's working at both in the UK and America, they've been studying termites. Now, termites are related to cockroaches and they're effectively blind, live, 
you know, these are specifically Namibian termites and they like living in the 80% humidity level. And they keep building and they cooperate and compete. So some of the termites are putting down mud because they're sensing in the environment side. Some are taking away and they're constantly doing this over and over and over again. And they're interesting. They actually build by sensing the kind of the gas levels in the termites because what they're actually doing is they coexist with these fungus that live underground. And we're not quite sure whether the fungus are in charge or the termites. It's a bit like people who've got gluten intolerance and your stomach swells up and then you've got your gut biome making you grumpy. Who's in charge? Is it your gut biome or your head? It's an interesting question. <laughs> uh, yeah. Or start thinking about you know, the microflora. So what can we learn from this? Well, think about this. They are the sensors as well as the builders. And how could you actually then develop, say, a, a 3D printing system that actually senses the environment and builds at the same time instead of just taking in the programs you put into it and it's passively part of the system. Um, you can look into various ways of building, not just buildings vertically, but they're effectively cities. So you're, you're looking at the flow of materials and how they're collecting it and building it as well. And they're, they're completely changing the structure all the time. The, you've got the built-in redundancy of the termites in there as well. And there's a fascinating way of looking at this kind of complex society, working in tandem with this this uh, fungus to, to survive. What's also, sorry, what's yeah. also interesting about these two examples that Richard has shown is the nature of the information available within the environment and the nature of the instructions. We're used to instructions being digital um, in, in computer programs, but here the, the, the sort of code is completely physical. Um, you're looking at, you know, you spoke about pheromones, you spoke about, um, in this case, uh, the, the humidity and, and, and the, the, the particular um, uh, sort of sensitivities of, of each organism. Um, and, and it's a very, very interesting way of looking at the nature of information. Yeah, and you could effectively do that. So think about there's a lot of studies now in building physics and building modeling and what if we could do that? We can't just walk around in our office and rearrange all the furniture just because we're feeling too hot. But that's that kind of thing is how can we teach people designing offices to design them more effectively based on the information that we are providing instead of them just kind of guesstimating or using computer models. So it's giving very much the humanness back as well. One quick question maybe for uh, the audience may be thinking right now, you know, we have a lot of young designers who watch the diff. There may be, I mean, some of this seems quite scientific, seems quite complex and technical. How do they get involved? How do they start? Um, should they feel intimidated by the challenge? Or, you know, what, what, what are some of the beginning points, I guess? What's step one? Step one is befriend a biologist and teach them, and they will teach you how to read a research paper. I mean, I've, over a long period of time, I used to give undergrad product designers and biology papers, and I would then had to clean up the messes I had exploded because there's very, very little information they really need to know. They just need to know what are the problems solved by that particular species? And it's literally, it could be a sentence or a paragraph. Um, it could be entering design challenges or literally exploring in reverse engineering products that already been designed. Step zero, I would say, is to be curious. Mm. You need to be curious. You need to be able to have that, um, but also um, be creative and encourage that creative thinking and, and looking and, you know, can you abstract and relate? things, um, you know, you, you sort of look at something and say, oh, this could be, this is similar to a fabric, for example, and then make those links. But I think curiosity is really the, the first step. Yeah, the example being outside, we were talking before we came on air, and um, Veronica's products could be used in the building industry as well. You know, I've got another business, my co-directors are interested as well, using the fabric for horse blankets. So it's looking at how many different areas and that it can be used in and just be creative because you never know where a product for example in the motor trade could be used in healthcare because it's a product that's been developed and might actually better applications and you're not quite so it's meeting not only the buyers but also an entrepreneur if you're an inventor you need to meet an entrepreneur who knows how to look to different markets as well.